Hey everybody, this is Ian O'Byrne. I just finished up issue number 115 of my newsletter. Uh, for those of you that haven't seen this before, or for all the subscribers out there, the name of the newsletter is Too Long Didn't Read. Uh, issue 115, some of these issues are a little bit more of a challenge to write than others. This one, for the most part, wrote itself. I've, I've taken a look at some of the things happening in literacy, technology, and education over the last two weeks. And this one, for the most part, was easy for me to write. Um, it's trying to get on paper or, or, you know, in pixel some of the things I've been thinking about. And I'm interested to see what you think about all of these as well, because I'm still trying to make up my mind. Um, so I shared two videos out there. Um, I was thinking about sharing some of my materials from my third year review and my narrative. I'm just going to put it into a post so people can check it out. I also shared out this great video um, that Laura Hilliger shared out um, in our private Slack channel about uh, you know the the new iPhone and the new development of these devices and how you know what is the overall impact on our planet and our lives um, and this was shared out through Greenpeace and so this is the the original version definitely remind uh, definitely recommend checking it out and seeing what it means uh, for you and share it with those uh, around you especially if you're a teacher show with your students. Um, this is a Pew Research report. There was actually two different reports that came out. The first of which talked about social media use and how, for the for you know two out of three Americans, uh, we use social media as our primary source of information. We've talked a lot about this in TLDR over the last couple months about the challenges where you know people will suggest that they get most of their news and info from social media but they don't really know where the news or information came from. So they'll talk about a story that they read or something that they learned, and people will say, you know, researchers will ask, well, where did you learn about this? And they would say, well, I, I learned it from Facebook. It's like, yeah, but, you know, this is a social network where people share things. Where did you, who wrote this? And they say, well, Facebook or leave me alone. Um, so that first report basically states a lot of the stuff that we already knew, but then the second report they released, uh, I believe on the 11th of September, was really interesting because they developed this information engagement typology. And they said that there's basically five distinct groups out there. They break this down to the eager and the willing, the confident, and they are in this like upper relatively engaged with info demographic. Then they look at this sort of middle of the road, the cautious and the curious, and they're a little bit more ambivalent about information. And what that means is that, you know, they they use these information sources, they use technology, they have access, but they don't really give high levels or low levels of trust in the sources. Um, so they're sort of just, you know, ha they have some sort of stasis as they look at this information. But then we had this, you know, relatively wary of information, this doubtful and the wary categories um, and and what you see is this level of trust in information sources, and it also has it, it links to levels of access to the internet, broadband, and smartphone adoption, um, and then also a willingness to an understanding of their digital skills and willingness to build up digital skill set or not build it up. Um, so it's really interesting to look at that typology and figure out. Okay, what are these distinct groups? What does it really mean for teaching and learning? And as I said, I think that, you know, some of you that read TLDR, you're looking at teaching and learning with these instructional technologies or, or the internet. But then also there's a lot of you that are content creators and you, you know, are, are builders online. And I want you to think about, or I think you should think about, what does this mean for the people that are engaging with my content? The second story that I talked about was looking at the Equifax uh, hack, uh, very problematic, um, but basically the, the gist of it is this happened about two weeks ago, um, and actually the hack, the hack happened much earlier than that, but Equifax de declined to make it transparent and tell us. And then in the meantime, we see that some of these executives have cashed out their stocks before it became public, so it's a huge mess. Um, and I think what this causes is we have to re-examine what this means for us. So one is these hacks are going to happen as no big surprise. Make sure that you can, you know, 
change your passwords quickly. Um, I think second, this also calls for uh, we need to know when these things happen. We need to expect that our companies are transparent with us. Um, and I know that that is a big ask, but I think that we need to require or respect or ask that they be transparent. Let us know when these things are happening. Also, um, I think that when they choose not to be transparent with us, then it gives us an opportunity to choose other companies. So with the Yahoo hack, you know, we had the opportunity to move over to other services for the most part. Um, but the question that we should, that, that the challenge with this is that you can't choose something else. There's three major credit, uh, credit, <laughs> there's three major credit providers. Um, but you don't really have a choice. Like you're automatically put into these you know, services. And so right off the bat, if they get hacked, you can't really do anything about it. Um, in fact, my uncle was calling to find out what recourse he had from this. And Equifax said that what he should do is basically pay $25 a month for a credit monitoring service to see the, whether or not he was in trouble, which they said that he was on the phone. So that's something that you need to think about. I need to think about, you know, collectively, we need to think about our policies. Um, a report from JISC talking about higher ed students and their need or, or desire to have more digitally literate um, educators and instructors in higher ed. Yeah, we know this story already. Um, but part of the problem is that I think that when we ask students what they want, I think that they're not really thinking broadly enough and entrepreneurially enough and also uh, progressively enough about the use of technology. So I think that we're saying, okay, well, yeah, I, I want to be, you know, I want instructors that are more digitally savvy and I want to be more digitally savvy. But I think what we're looking at is a digital savvy that we probably needed about a decade ago and not what you will need a decade from now when you're out in the workforce. Um, so yes, we definitely need to do a better job in our use of technology in and out of the classroom in pre-K up through higher ed and beyond. Um, and it's good to see these reports, but I think at the same time, we need to think about, okay, if we were to really invent the wheel, what would we do? And that's, you know, but that's my own um, perspectives on that. Um, this was another thing that that I've been thinking a lot about over the last two, two weeks to a month. Um, following the election, we've taken a look at, okay, what was the role of the social networks in all of this? And so we've seen some stories about dark ads and targeted ads where, you know, uh, they would find out about specific populations and only show ads, um, you know, trying to, uh, you know, massage the thought process um, or sway public opinion about a given topic. So you would see these reporters that would go into areas of the U.S. and people would come out of political rallies and they would say, well, I'm really concerned about this one topic. And the, they would have a concern about a story that no one really knows about. And we find out later that these stories are untrue. Um, and so what we find out is that whoever it is, whether it's these companies or Russian bots or whatever, they're basically using these social networks to target people and give you misinformation and and basically sway your mind. Um, and that's terribly problematic. Um, and so I, I have a question about all this, like, what what should we do about this? We have these social networks, you know, Facebook came out and said, well, that's not really a big deal. You don't really need to worry about it. I disagree. I think that this is a, a huge problem. Um, and it make and we should question what is the role of this. Um, and and I had other links in there about you know fa Facebook uh, profiting from these targeted ads and there's stories about these you know hate groups that bots and other groups were using Facebook and other split other you know online social networks as a way to sort of like spread information about these hate rallies um, or target you know people of specific religions. Um, and talk about them or people that hate specific religions. So I think it's a, a very challenging problem that we need to start to think about and understand. Uh, the last one that really blew up in my social networks, and there's an incredible feed on Facebook um, that I would like to, con to continue to think about and unpack is, you know, two years ago or in 2015, Reddit had a lot of challenges following um, some really bad 
press about, you know, some hate groups and offensive groups. But then there was also the hack where a lot of the celebrity photos were released on Reddit. So Reddit wanted to clean up their act. So what they did is they started to police and they would quarantine specific subreddits and they would ban certain individuals. And there was a lot of pushback, especially for those within the Reddit communities where they're saying, you know, we value free speech. This is going against our freedom of speech. Um, you know, all people need a place to talk, even these people that spread this hateful discourse. Um, but Reddit went ahead with it anyway, and, and I was, for the most part, against what Reddit did. But then you take a look at, and, you know, a lot of great research in here from Georgia Institute of Tech. You can read the report here. And all f for the data geeks there, you can check out um, the, how they did this. But for the most part, this worked. And so I'm wondering, looking at what we've talked about with, you know, Facebook doing or not doing and these social networks doing or not doing a better job to police this and not having hate speech out there. What I'm wondering is, what does this mean for our online spaces? So we see Reddit does this and, and there is value in it, quote unquote, worked. But it really has me thinking about these intersections between literacy and freedom of speech and technology. And I don't know the answer. I'm trying to think through it. But after a really great debate on Facebook, which you can go hunt down um, in my Facebook feed, you know, I'm wondering, is there a terms of use or a terms of service for freedom of speech? Um, and even as I typed that earlier today, and even as, in, as I'm saying it now, like I really have a problem with saying that. But I'm wondering, um, and I need to think about it more. And I'm wondering, like, what you all think about it. Um, in terms of the make section, I've been following uh, Doug's posts on how to blog, and then more specifically, Aaron had a really great, thoughtful overview of his writing workflow. And this is something that I've been thinking about. And one of the things is I have a, I do most of my writing in uh, Google Docs for journals and articles and, and chapters. But then my writing for my newsletter and writing for my blog happens in WordPress or in MailChimp. I have a problem with that. Um, you know, I want to be able to have like one good copy. Um, and so what I'm thinking is perhaps there's a need to use, um, Trello to organize my writing tasks and topics and then use Google Keep as like post-it notes and I'll have po I'll have videos about it this week. Um, use Google Keep as a way to you know, as a way to have like post-it notes and then use Google Docs and the new versioning that they have to keep versions of drafts over time. So if I have a journal article or chapter, yeah, I can use Google Docs to save, you know, versions of this and collaborate with others. But then when I have blog posts, yeah, I, you know, or more specifically, when I have MailChimp, you know, newsletter pieces, when I have TLDR, I want to write it in a Google Doc and sort of like easily add it over to MailChimp and send it out. So I have one copy off in a Google Doc that I can share out with others. And if I start it, I can end it later. So I, I have a general problem with just leaving all of this content in MailChimp or in WordPress, even though I own my WordPress site. Um, in terms of the consider part, uh, I always put together one thought, you know, I look for a quote that sort of distills and synthesizes everything all together. Um, and I pulled this piece from Aristotle um, and it it really crystallizes my thinking about this week and the news and thinking about um, some of those bigger questions. So I, I'm basically giving myself latitude and perhaps giving you latitude to think about that question about terms of use, terms of service, and freedom of speech, or what do we do with these social networks, or do we buy in or not, or press against it. And I think that we have to have these discussions. I think that we have to think through this. Um, I have initial seedlings of ideas about what this all means, um, and some of you that know me well know where those seedlings will go, but for the most part, I, I don't want to like really utter it just the fact that I'm uttering the questions now and I'm thinking through it, it it that's a lot for me just to sort of think through because my thinking really has changed over the last or I think it's changing over the last month um, as I continue to unpack a lot of these uh, intersections following the US election but I'm still trying to think through and I'm, more importantly I'm interested in what you all think um, 
And last but not least, when I'm finished my newsletter, I basically think through the quote and think through what I've shared. And I've started to add in the, the title of this. Now what I'm using lately is I'm using a, a lyric from a song as a way to crystallize everything all together. Um, so I've been doing that over the last like 10 uh, newsletters, but this is something new. Um, so once again, that's issue 115 of TLDR, TLDR. That's too long, didn't read. Um, if you're not a subscriber already, then I think you should be. Um, each week I put this thing out. It's on a Friday or a Saturday morning, um, but I basically put it out once a week. And it's me synthesizing what I think is important about literacy, technology, education, and some of the stuff in between. And this stuff is not easy to make sense of. And so it's helpful for me. And I think it's helpful for you also to think about what are these intersections. Um, so I have educators, I have parents, I have developers, I have normal people out there. I have super sophisticated educate, you know, higher ed people. I've got all of these different people and I try to write for all of you so that we can think about this collectively because especially an issue like this, I think we need a multiplicity of voices. We need a lot of people talking to figure out what does this all mean? So with that, I'm going to zip it because I've already talked too much. Um, but this is issue 115 of TLDR. You can subscribe at uh, the link for my website. And hopefully it was a benefit. Subscribe to the channel. Like the video. Tell me in the comments if, you, if I did something right or if I majorly messed something up. And by all means, shoot me an email if there's something in this week's issue that you liked or did not like. Thanks a lot.